The Atlantic runs a story saying we all know we're killing babies. Then Planned Parenthood launches an online death camp finder to help women kill their babies. The Washington Post celebrates the personhood of orangutans, while Ohio Republicans seek to grant all unborn children these rights of personhood. We will examine the escalating fight over personhood. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Welcome to Unaborted Today. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, if this show has been helpful for you and you've been enjoying this content and commentary on what's going on in the country on the issue of abortion and equipping you to defend your pro-life beliefs, then please give us a rating and review. If you're on iTunes, just head down, hit the five stars, give us a little review about what you think about the show, and that really helps us reach more people. So we're going to start this episode examining an article in The Atlantic called The Dishonesty of the Abortion Debate. And it's actually going to be in the Atlantic's December 2019 issue. However, the online article is available already, and it's written by Caitlin Flanagan, who's not a pro-life individual. She is pro-choice, and yet she identifies some aspects of the abortion issue that are very, very important and examines what she determines to be certain dishonest aspects in the abortion debate on either side of the aisle. However, she gets very close to the truth the truth that abortion kills baby humans who share our human nature. And so I want to examine some of the pieces in this article because it cuts through so much of the propaganda and so much of the mainstream media's talking points on the issue of abortion by getting down to the heart of the matter, which is that most people really know we're killing babies. And that's due in large part to ultrasonography and our ability to see the baby in their mother's wombs now more clearly than ever before. So she spends the first part of her article talking about all of the dangerous ways that women used to obtain illegal abortions, even through using Lysol and other dangerous ways. And so, of course, she's talking about the importance of keeping abortion legal because of these dangerous ways. However, she becomes much more intellectually honest later. And here's what she says. She says, these sonogram images are so richly detailed that many expectant mothers pay to have one made in a shopping mall studio much in the spirit in which they might bring the baby to a portrait studio. They are one thing and one thing only, baby pictures. <sighs> That's exactly right. We all know that these are babies. And the excitement that mothers have to get pictures of their unborn child in the womb is very similar to the excitement that you would have to take your newborn to the studio to get baby pictures. It's the same baby and we all know it. She continues and says, most abortions happen in the first trimester. A very smart and very kind friend reassured me. I didn't, I didn't need to worry about those detailed images of babies. By the time they had grown to such recognizably human proportions, most of them were well past the stage of development in which the majority of abortions took place. And I held on to that comforting piece of information until it occurred to me to look at one of those images taken at the end of the first trimester. I often wish I hadn't. And here is the 12-week ultrasound photo from her article that she includes showing how human this early baby looks like. Not a potential person, not a blob of tissue, a baby. And this is a picture of a human baby. So she talks about this photo and she says that a picture of a 12-week fetus is a, is a Rorschach test. Some people say that such an image doesn't trouble them, that the fetus suggests the possibility of a developed baby, but it's far too removed from one to give them pause. I envy them. When I see that image, I have the opposite reaction. I think here is one of us. Here is a baby. Here is a baby. Here is a person. This is the self-evident recognition and truth. And the importance of prenatal imagery and ultrasonography imagery and the use of imagery, period, in the culture, but particularly on the issue of abortion, really can't be overstated. There's a, there's a very important strategy in utilizing this imagery, not just because the images are true, but because of how the culture learns and thinks and reasons 
on moral issues like abortion today. Let me give you an example of that. So Neil Postman, a cultural writer in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, points out that with the advent of television, America shifted from this word-based culture that had an emphasis on coherent linear thought to an image-based one where thinking was dominated by feeling, intuition, and images. In other words, we think and learn visually far more than we used to. Most cultures were word-driven. They were word-based cultures because we didn't have photography. And even with the invention of photography, we didn't have television. It wasn't until the advent of television and now our phones and our computers that the culture began to change how their thinking was directed and dominated. And that, that is dominated now more today by feeling, intuition, and images. And so because we think and learn visually, it's vitally important that on the most divisive issue in the world right now and in American politics, abortion, that we're seeing who these unborn children are with what is the reality baby pictures, as she calls it. So she continues here. And remember, she's not a pro-life advocate. She says, what I can't face about abortion is the reality of it. <laughs> At least she's acknowledging that it is an issue of reality and not ideology, not pure subjectivism or feeling. Abortion is actually a reality. It actually kills babies. That's real. She says that these are human beings, the most vulnerable among us, and we have no care for them. How terrible to know that in the space of an hour, a baby could be alive, his heart beating, his kidneys creating the urine that becomes the amniotic fluid of his safe home, and then be dead. His heart stopped, his body soon to be discarded. She says that the argument for abortion, if made honestly, requires many words. It must evoke the recent past, the dire consequences to women of making a very simple medical procedure illegal, right? This is the standard argument. Got to keep it legal. If you make it illegal, women will die or be injured or wounded. So she's saying the argument for abortion requires many words. But she finishes by saying the argument against it doesn't even take a single word. The arguments against it is a picture. The arguments against abortion is simply a picture. Baby pictures that reflect the reality that the unborn child in the womb is indeed human. And as our technology and ultrasonography and embryoscopy becomes more and more advanced, the abortion debate and narrative changes more and more. And it forces advocates of abortion to run into their holes, to go hide and cower in their holes. They have no arguments in the face of a human baby that looks like you and I, simply located six inches away in their mother's womb. And their arguments become that much more ghoulish because you can no longer argue from ignorance. You can no longer argue from a lack of scientific consensus or from a blob of tissue because we can all see the images now, can't we? We know that this is a baby. These are baby pictures and abortion does indeed end the life of that baby and rip them from their mother's womb. So this was a very interesting piece and a very honest piece from someone who doesn't even identify as pro-life that admits that we all know we're killing babies. And so that's going to be in the Atlantic print edition in December 2019 and could be a very good piece and conversation for the culture. But secondly, I wanted to talk about Planned Parenthood launching their new online death camp finders is what I'm calling it. Um, of course, they're calling it an abortion care finder or an abortion finder tool. And and this is this is hilarious, right? In contrast to a woman being intellectually honest this Caitlin Flanagan and admitting that we all know it's babies. We all know that it kills a baby and we need to acknowledge that and say that. Let's be honest about our position. The great deniers of reality, <laughs> Planned Parenthood, continue to pretend that babies are not babies. But as Caitlin Flanagan rightly pointed out in that article, the argument for abortion requires many words. And so we're going to see Alexis McGill Johnson, the president of Planned Parenthood, using many words in order to justify abortion and their new strategies to make it easier for women to access their services that kill those babies. So there's an article from The Cut, a very left news source on November 13th, called Planned Parenthood Launches Abortion Finder Tool. 
And Planned Parenthood is already has this functioning on their website. And the article says, after noticing that one of the most searched phrases on its website is, quote unquote, abortion near me, Planned Parenthood launched a new online tool called the Abortion Care Finder. Uh, you, of course, so disgusting euphemism. People who visit Planned Parenthood's website will receive information about the nearest abortion centers, as well as any state requirements they would need after they input personal information like their age, zip code, and first day of their last period. See, so Planned Parenthood wants to age the child so they know how much to charge the parent for the dismemberment of that child. So, but if the baby is not a person, right, if they're going to deny the personhood, if, if, if this baby is not a person at all and they don't get any rights of personhood, then there is nothing morally wrong with an abortion finder making it easier for women to locate the nearest clinic. However, if the baby is a person like you and I, then this abortion finder tool is another disgusting strategy to import as many abortion clients as possible into Planned Parenthood to increase their revenue. Oh, look, people are searching the term abortion near me. Let me make it easier for you to find our fetal death camp so we can increase our profits. But as I said, denying personhood to biological human beings always requires carefully and many carefully selected words because it is self-evident that human beings are persons. That's a self-evident truth. As Caitlin Flanagan correctly pointed out, she could not avoid the fact but realized that these were baby pictures. It's self-evident that a human being in the womb is, of course, a person like you and I. And so it requires many carefully selected words and euphemistic gymnastics in order to make the argument for abortion and the argument for a strategy like this that increases Planned Parenthood's profits. And so the article reports, the abortion care finder uses technology to help put agency back in the hands of our patients, Alexis McGill-Johnson, acting president and CEO of Planned Parenthood said. Oh, we're just putting agency back in the hands of our patients. We're not, we're not, we're not putting up a big uh, find me here sign to, to make it more quick and easy for them to access our, our feticide services. She says, as politicians are increasingly trying to keep people from accessing care or even information related to their sexual and reproductive health, it's our duty to ensure people can still access health care and accurate, trustworthy information no matter what. Wow. Humana, humana, humana. That's a lot, a lot of words because it takes a lot of carefully selected words in order to try to make abortion sound like something other than feticide, sound like something other than the intentional killing of an unborn human who is clearly a baby human, a small human like you and I. These clinical euphemisms that are used in an attempt to make the argument for abortion and ignore the personhood of the unborn child are, are reminiscent of the same type of reasoning and arguments that were used in order to justify slavery. Den the denial of personhood to those that you deem less, to those that you deem as subhuman, and the victims that you have a vested interest in dehumanizing because you actually want something from them, right? With blacks, it was their work product. With unborn children, oftentimes we kill them for their embryonic stem cells or simply because they're a burden to society. They're a burden to our family. And so we want to eliminate them. But in each circumstance, it requires very clinical euphemistic language to make it sound like that the acts in question are actually not that bad. And that's certainly true in this case. So our argument against Planned Parenthood and this abortion finder tool that's helping more women kill their babies is this, this photo. Here is your baby. Here is your baby. Look at them. It's a little baby picture. Because indeed, the argument against abortion, while it can include many words, does not require any words. It simply requires a picture of reality. And yet the lengths that Planned Parenthood will go to in order to stick their entire head in the sand <laughs> and deny reality that the unborn baby is a baby and a person is found in their literature that they've produced in order to train their people how to talk about abortion. Here's what I mean. The International Planned Parenthood Federation last year released a pamphlet called How to Talk About Abortion Guide. <laughs> how to Talk About Abortion Guide. And they have a list of phrases and words that they don't want you to say. And then they have the word that they recommend that you say, right? And you can see it right here. So don't call it a baby. Don't call it an unborn child. Don't call it an unborn, 
uh, human, call it an embryo, call it a fetus, or even call it the pregnancy. <laughs> the pregnancy. Training people to use dehumanizing language to stick your head fully in the sand to ignore the reality that this is in fact a baby human. They won't even use the word baby. Well, I mean, baby can be used for plenty of different ages, can it? People call their one-year-olds babies. People call their five-month-year-old babies. And people call their unborn children babies. It perfectly applies to the same human being through their first couple years of development. But that word is too humanizing, you see. Don't use the word baby. That, 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 that insinuates that this is a little person. So let's use clinical euphemism, a very clinical, clean language that doesn't evoke any type of emotion or any type of relationship to said victim so that we can inculcate the society with a pro-abortion propaganda message that dehumanizes the victims that we have a vested interest in eliminating to increase our profits. They literally released a guide saying, don't say the word baby. <laughs> and yet, thankfully, we do have some intellectually honest pro-choice individuals like Caitlin Flanagan at The Atlantic who will say this is clearly a baby. Look at the lengths, though, that the perpetrators of genocide will go to in order to deny personhood to their victims. So we're going to talk more a little bit about this escalating battle over the term personhood, over the idea of personhood. So next, we're going to look at the Washington Post celebrating the personhood of orangutans because they're sentient. But unborn, sentient humans are not persons. Meanwhile, Ohio Republicans fight for the personhood of actual persons unborn persons. But first, if you like this show and want to hear more great content and commentary from the front lines of the pro-life movement, head on over to patreon.com slash unaborted and become a patron of the show. Five, 10, 15 bucks a month, whatever. Something small that just helps us crowdfund this important show and be able to increase our production value, bring on guests and eventually do two episodes a week and have more perks to help equip you to defend life, interact with other unaborted human beings to encourage one another to be advocates for life. Because sadly, my colleague and friend nailed it when he said that there are more people working full-time to kill babies than there are working full-time to save them. That is the sad reality. <laughs> and so we need more people getting involved full time or as part time advocates and voices for the unborn in our culture. And that's what this show is geared towards doing is equipping you to defend life and know what's going on in the country so that you're so that you're spiritually and morally woke. So if that's important to you and you want to help increase the production and value and reach of this show, head on over to patreon.com slash unaborted and become a patron of the show. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Unaborted. So the Washington Post, uh, the great the great friend and uh, arm of the Democratic Party, is uh, published a, a piece recently uh, celebrating that orangutans are persons. And they highlight this story. This is actually from a November 7th post at Washington Post saying that, quote, a 33-year-old orangutan granted legal personhood by a judge in Argentina in 2015 is settling into her new surroundings at the Center for Great Apes in Central Florida. So this orangutan had already been granted rights of personhood in Argentina and then was just recently brought to America, to Florida, for, for their new home. And uh, so Washington Post runs this piece on just how great it is that we're respecting the dignity of this animal. So it, it continues in saying that Judge Elena Libertori's landmark ruling in 2015 declared that Sandra is legally not an animal, but a non-human person, thus entitled to some legal rights enjoyed by people and better living conditions. With that ruling, I wanted to tell society something new, that animals are sentient beings, and that the first thing they have is our obligation to respect them, she told the Associated Press. So you see, because the orangutan is sentient, therefore, it deserves us to respect them. Well, what's sentience? Well, sentience is the ability to feel and perceive. Basically, that's sentience, right? That could be ability to feel actual pain, physical pain, emotional pain, perceive other people in your surroundings. That's sentience. Well, first of all, let's just be clear. Sentience is not a good standard for human value, for value. Because if you're not sentient, it would follow that you don't have human value. And we can think of examples 
of people who were not sentient who we would still recognize are persons, right? So if you're in a coma, for example, you're not sentient, but it would still be wrong for me to kill you. <laughs> so we can't ground human value or right to life purely in sentience by itself or solely. But her argument here is that this animal deserves respect from us because the animal is sentient. Well, unborn children can feel pain at 13 and a half weeks, and that's not really even disputed in the medical community by 13 and a half weeks. And then Dr. Maureen Kondik, an associate professor of neurobiology and anatomy at the University of Utah, who's done a lot of research on fetal pain, has testified before that fetuses can feel pain by eight weeks gestation when the spinal circuitry for pain detection is established. So, I mean, if babies are feeling pain at eight weeks and the majority of abortions happen after five weeks, then we're killing tons of babies who are sentient and can feel pain. But of course, the Washington Post has no problem with that. They're one of the most pro-abortion media news sites out there. So you see, there's a few problems here. One, you can't ground human value or dignity in sentience because we can think of examples of born people who are temporarily not sentient and therefore, according to that standard, wouldn't have human value. But if that is the standard, then why aren't we granting that level of respect and obligation to respect sentient beings if the unborn is definitely sentient by 13 and a half weeks and likely even eight weeks? So according to this reasoning, sentient monkeys deserve personhood, but sentient unborn babies don't deserve personhood. <laughs> this, this is the kind of strange conclusions you're left with when you, when you follow the, the philosophy of the abortion juggernaut. When you, just, when you just follow their reasoning, you follow their ideas, you're left with these types of consequences. And as I said before, if you don't like the consequences, the intellectual and moral consequences of a worldview that you abide by, you should abandon the worldview if you don't like the consequences that it yields in your life or in society. Okay, so let's take a step back. This is a big conversation. This is a big question. This has been a big question for decades and millennia in philosophy, which is what does it mean to be a person, right? What is a person in the first place? So apparently we're granting it to orangutans, but we won't grant it to biological human babies in their mother's wombs. So one view of personhood says that being a person means having the immediate capacity for reason, moral agency, consciousness, and self-consciousness. You have to be immediately able to practice those capacities, and that's what makes you a person. And there are plenty of pro-abortion philosophers such as Peter Singer and David Boonin that will make these types of arguments. But it leads to consequences that even those, many of those philosophers don't like, though they still refuse to abandon those ideas. For example, if you're only a person if you can immediately practice the capacity of reason, moral agency, rationality, and consciousness – well, that's going to leave us with the consequence of saying that born infants are not persons and could be killed. They cannot immediately practice rationality, moral agency, or consciousness. They're not self-aware of themselves yet. So can we kill them? Okay, no. Same thing with a coma. They wouldn't immediately be able to practice those capacities. So that's one view of personhood, the immediate capacity to practice these functions. We should rightly reject that view of personhood because of its dangerous moral consequences. The other view and the view that the pro-life movement holds by and really any advocate of human equality has to hold by says that a person is someone that has the natural ordering towards reason, moral agency, consciousness, and self-consciousness, which all human beings have in virtue of their humanity, and that those capacities will be realized in time. So you see, it's in virtue of being a human being to have those capacities. All things being equal, you will realize the capacity for reason, moral agency, and consciousness if you're given time. But it is in virtue of being a human to have those things, which is the exact thing that is not the case in the case of an animal, right? It is not in virtue of being an animal to eventually have the immediate capacity to practice reason, moral agency, and consciousness. This is why we wouldn't, this is why we don't put tigers on death row for mauling a man. We literally don't hold them responsible. They don't have moral agency and they're not persons. So this is the other view of personhood. 
So that would follow from this view that all human beings are persons, right? Because yes, the unborn child cannot immediately practice these functions, but neither can the infant. And they will all realize those in time. And it's in virtue of having and be and in having a human nature to have those capacities. So this would mean that all human beings are persons and you can't separate the term human being from person. They're essentially synonyms. If you're a human, you're a person, okay? However, there could be non-human persons. Now, this judge wants to say that the orangutan is a non-human person. I think we've just given fairly good reasons to reject that and to believe that animals are not persons because they can't exercise these capacities that pretty much everyone has agreed are the capacities you need to be a person. But there could be non-human persons. For example, angels. If you're a Christian and you believe that there are angels, these would be persons, right? They, they, they communicate with us. They speak with us. They worship God. They obey God. They've done things for him. The scripture says that many of us have actually um, entertained angels, <laughs> not being unaware that we're doing that. So those could be non-human persons. An alien, if there is extraterrestrial life, just to kind of go out on a limb, those could also be non-human persons. Those aliens might have the same personhood functions, but wouldn't be biologically human. Furthermore, from the Christian worldview, of course, God himself is a non-human person. And we as human beings created in his image are persons, but God is not a human, right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not a human. God the Father is not a human. Jesus Christ stepped down into, into, into earth, into our timeline, and took on human flesh and was both fully God and fully man. But God is not a human. He's certainly a person. So there can be non-human persons, but there are no but every human being is a person, right? There's no such thing as a human non-person, if that makes sense. So clearly animals are excluded from this definition of person. This orangutan is not a person, okay? And if he punched someone or attacked someone who was caring for him, we probably wouldn't charge him with first degree murder. I, and maybe this judge would, I guess she could be intellectually consistent, but most of us would think that was kind of strange because we know that animals are not persons. But this attempt to dignify animals by granting them personhood does not elevate animals to the level of humans. It actually does the opposite. It reduces humans to the level of animals because humans are exceptional in the very ways that we're not like animals, right? I just told you the ways that we're not like animals. And so if you stick your head in the sand and insist that animals are persons, that, that doesn't give the animal the capacities that a person has. It actually denigrates the human race by suggesting that we're no different than animals <laughs> because we are exceptional in the very ways that we're not like animals. So this attempt to dignify animals by granting them personhood is only going to send a message to the culture that we as human beings are no different than animals. We're just another breed. We're another species of animals, which is a popular view by, held by many people. And yet our favorite cultural prophet, C.S. Lewis, writing in The Abolition of Man, pointed out some of the consequences to doing this. He actually was specifically addressing the animal rights movement. And he said, if they established through culture or law that human beings have no intrinsic dignity greater than that of any animal, the world would not be a better place for either humankind or animals. Instead, it would be a utilitarian nightmare in which the strong would destroy the weak, in which power-crazed leaders would destroy everyone who loved peace, in which the wealth of the world would be concentrated in the hands of a murderous few, in which mercy would be unknown and the only virtue would be the ability to survive, in which the only right would be the right to die. You see, if you say that human beings don't have anything intrinsically valuable about them, that there's nothing dignifying about being a member of the human species because, see, you're really just part of the animal kingdom. You're just another species of animals. And so, therefore, the orangutan is a person. Any other animal we de determine is a person. Sure, you're a person as well, but you're on the same level as animals. That sends a message to the culture that we're no different than animals. The orangutan doesn't appreciate the fact that he was granted personhood. 
He's not rejoicing over the fact that he's a free moral agent with the ability for rationality. (laughs) He's just eating food and crapping. But if you say that he is like a person, you actually tell real people that they're no different than animals. So you shouldn't be surprised if human beings begin to live like animals. All C.S. Lewis did here was paint a picture of the animal kingdom, didn't he? It's about power struggles, he says. It's that the only virtue is the ability to survive, the survival of the fittest. And the only right is the right to die. And this is literally just an animal kingdom. So in an attempt to dignify animals by granting them personhood, all we've done is, is reduce the exceptionality of human beings because they're persons, because they have capacities that separate them from every other species. And this is why the Bible says that human beings were created in the image of God. The divine logic of the universe breathed life into human beings with that same divine type of logic, the ability for rationality, moral agency, and self-consciousness. That is exactly what makes us different from animals. And so this is just another attempt by the pro-abortion movement to dehumanize human beings by saying we're no different than animals. And if we're no different than animals, then have abortions on demand through the day of birth. Who cares? It's just survival of the fittest and might makes right. That is the catch-all phrase for the animal kingdom. Might makes right. Whoever's strongest survives. And that's certainly not the type of morality that we want to determine how human persons actually live. Meanwhile, While this crazy debate is being had by people with their heads in the sand saying that animals are persons and unborn children are not persons, Ohio Republicans move to fight for the rights of actual persons who are being denied personhood rights, which are the unborn persons in their mother's wombs. And so NBC4I, which is the Columbus NBC News on November 15th, reported, quote, the bill introduced this week at the State House in Ohio by Republican State Representatives Ron Hood and Candace Keller would recognize a fetus as a person, opening the mother and healthcare providers up to murder charges if an abortion is performed. The Right to Life Action Coalition of Ohio is behind this piece of legislation. Now, this is a controversial debate within the pro-life movement. Many people do not think that the consequences for an abortion should be the same for mothers or abortionists as would be killing your toddler. But if you want to be intellectually consistent and you believe that the unborn child is a full person with the same equal intrinsic dignity, value, and worth as born people, then you would have to maintain that the consequences for killing that equally valuable human being would need to be the same as it would be if you were killing a toddler. Now, we can acknowledge some of the complexities, right, where if obviously if a man is pressuring his girlfriend or his his daughter or forcing her to have an abortion if she is underage and it's her father, that obviously changes things, right? This woman is not choosing this optionally. Furthermore, many young women are manipulated by pro-choice propaganda in the first five weeks that it's just a blob of tissue. And they're 14, 15, 16, they don't know anything. And they believe this lie that right now it literally is not a human. And that's a huge failing of our educational systems. The fact that so many people actually don't think It's a full human from the moment of conception because we do indeed know it is a human being. So this bill is seeking to recognize the personhood of actual unborn persons and grant them the same levels of protection that we would any other human being. This is actually an outright abortion ban that these Ohio legislators are trying for. Now, has any state ever passed an all or nothing outright abortion ban? No, they haven't. Not since... Roe versus Wade made abortion the law of the land in 1973. But there's been shifts, there's been shifting and moving, right, in the pro life movement. We have a very pro life administration on our side in DC, and we are seeing more and more people in the pro life movement rise up to the challenge. We have a better Supreme Court than we've had in a while. Will they overturn Roe versus Wade? I don't know yet. I'm not sure. But they're certainly more pro-life than they were under Obama. And we certainly have a better chance with this Supreme Court than we would have with Obama's or that we would have with Hillary Clinton's, obviously. So this is what many pro-life legislators are seeking to do across the country is to come up with legislation that they know is technically unconstitutional because it goes against Roe versus Wade. But they're doing it as 
a strategy in order to challenge Roe. They want a challenge case to Roe and then believing the Supreme Court is on our side that will actually overturn Roe versus Wade. So the uh, Cleveland.com article on November 14th was reporting that Representative Candace Keller of the bill said, quote, the time has come to abolish abortion in its entirety and recognize that each individual has the inviolable and inalienable right to life. Only respect for life can be the foundation of a free society that supports peace, justice, and integrity. And this is a very similar logic and argumentation that Abraham Lincoln used arguing against slavery. This idea that you can't have a just and free society as long as there's an entire class of human beings that that freedom is being withheld from, that that justice is being withheld from, that actually injustice is being perpetrated towards. And so Abraham Lincoln on December 1st in 1862, months before the Emancipation Proclamation, he spoke a message to Congress and he said, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. The idea here is that granting freedom to the slave is just a recognition of their humanity, personhood, and intrinsic dignity, value, and worth. And in doing that, we're creating a more free and just society for everyone by including all human beings in that system that respects the rights and dignity of all individuals rather than setting aside an entire class of human beings and treating them as sub human. And so Candace Keller is getting right to the point here that only respect for life can be the foundation of a free society that supports peace, justice, and integrity. So this is really good. These are people who are actually fighting for real personhood of actual persons that the state has denied personhood to for nearly 47 years. So what does this mean for America and the abortion debate more largely? Well, it means that the fight is heating up, isn't it? (laughs) The fight over the abortion debate, the fight over personhood, and the fight over human value is heating up. Who gets to decide who lives and who dies? Is the unborn merely a human non-person that we can dismember? Because Roe versus Wade said that in the eyes of the law, the unborn is not a person. Or are they a full person like you and I who's had their personhood stripped from them and ought to have it given back to them? Because our system of government is created to protect the rights of its citizens. And the right to life is the most fundamental right because you don't have any other rights if the right to life is denied and stripped from you. So this is an increasingly heated up battle between those who live in reality and those who live purely by ideology. And it's becoming more and more clear that those who deny that the unborn child is a person are living solely by a satanic ideology with no basis in reality. How can you continue to hold the position that it's not a human, it's not a person, and it has no rights with the increases, advancements in embryology and embryoscopy that shows who this baby is, knowing that most abortions are a painful procedure for this baby, and knowing that they share our human nature? Only by living in ideology and sticking your head fully in the sand up to your shoulders can you continue maintaining that it's not a human person with rights. And so this battle is going to continue heating up over who's a person and who gets personhood rights. Is it every human being or is it only some human beings? And if you're an unborn human being, you don't get those personhood rights. And this is not the first time we've had a debate or conflict over who counts as a person, (laughs) right? Literally, Abraham Lincoln's passion in life, his calling was to grant these personhood rights to all persons, to the African-American persons in our midst. We fought a civil war over this, guys. Now, will we fight a civil war over abortion? I don't know. It's been nearly 47 years, and we haven't yet, 47 years of legalized abortion. But this is not the first time we've had an ideological or even violent conflict and debate over who's a person, who counts as one of us, and who gets to decide who lives and who dies. So you need to be informed, educated, and equipped to engage in this debate, hopefully before it gets bloody, and we can work through our system of government to grant the personhood rights legally 
that unborn children already have morally, already have biologically, scientifically, and in reality. Well, thanks for joining me today. Head on over to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, give the show a review and rating. It really helps. And if you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to my website, sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com for my speaking schedule. Sign up for my newsletter for training videos so that you get regular equipping to your inbox to defend life. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. 